She's Joy Epstein. He's Frank Schwab. I'm Jason Fitz. Welcome to Inside Coverage. You know the deal at this point. It's the why and the how of all things going on in the NFL as we have almost reached the midpoint. We are flying through. And as we were getting ready to take this morning, the entire rundown was thrown away because we had massive breaking news. And that is DeAndre Hopkins has been traded to the Kansas City Chiefs from the Tennessee Titans for a fifth round pick that could become a fourth round pick. Let's just start. Like we, we usually, we shoot the you know what we we meander about. But let's let's just get right into this. Frank, why in the hell would anybody help the Kansas City Chiefs? <laughs> yeah, especially get that that mighty mighty fifth round pick, which is probably going to be the last pick of the fifth round. To conditionally, you go to a fourth, I guess. I, I don't know how much this really helps the Chiefs. To be honest, I I, I wonder what DeAndre Hopkins has left. I, he was pretty solid last year. He's really fallen off this year after dealing with the knee issue in training camp. He has 15 catches for 173 yards. I, I think the question obviously is how much of that is just a broken Tennessee passing game? How much of that is DeAndre Hopkins just hitting the age curve? I, it happens to everybody. If anybody can get something out of DeAndre Hopkins, it's going to be Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. I get that. But I, I don't know that this necessarily replaces Rasheed Rice, let's say, which is their big loss on offense. The Chiefs offense has been, let's say, mediocre all year. And I don't know that Hopkins really pushes the needle. I guess the the price wasn't that much. I mean, again, fifth round pick probably. Who cares? Uh, that's fine. I, I just, again, this is going to, it's DeAndre Hopkins. It's a big name. It's a guy we remember being an all pro with the Houston Texans, but that was a lot of years ago. I don't know if that guy's still here. I don't know what the reasonable expectations are for DeAndre Hopkins in this Chiefs offense. I think I woke up on the cynical side of the bed this morning because we are living in a world where in the last week we had Devontae Adams traded, we had Amari Cooper traded, and now Fitz is starting off a show being like, the entire rundown was thrown out the window with massive breaking news about an aging receiver going to a quarterback who can work with any receiver, so... Fitz, you know we love you, but I had to give you a little bit of a hard time for that, like, radio background showing through. But, this, hey, this is why you're hosting the show and not us, because I would not be quite as enthusiastic, and I love the enthusiasm. That said, I think it's interesting because... I think it's interesting because when all of the noise started this week about the Cooper Cup potential trade opportunities, and I know we're going to get to those, I think one of the things that came to mind is, on one hand, yes, the Kansas City Chiefs are in the AFC, so that is good if you're the Rams trying to trade to them, but... The Chiefs don't need a Cooper Cup. Not that they couldn't use a Cooper Cup, but they don't need to like give what the Rams are going to want for a Cooper Cup because we've seen Tyreek Hill walk out the door and them still win Super Bowls. We've seen them lose big pieces, and I don't think we should give Patrick Mahomes no weapons, but I don't think that we need to completely break the bank on other weapons. I think Hopkins is kind of like the right space of where they should be playing. They needed a little more help. They needed something. Also, when you think about who is it, Kareem Hunt, um, I'm trying to think who else they've had come back in the door recently. Juju, of their age. Uh, yeah. yeah, Juju I mean, Smith-Schuster. Yeah. I mean, like, they are the places we've talked about with the Patriots back in the day, and now the Chiefs, where if you're aging and you had glory days, and then you want to revive your glory days, you should go play with the Chiefs from Patrick Mahomes and be schemed by Andy Reid. So I do think that they will be able to elevate DeAndre potentially in a way that uh, some other teams wouldn't. I was talking to someone who has worked in the league with DeAndre, and I think on one hand, he said from a schematic standpoint, uh, this person was curious about the role of Travis Kelsey and DeAndre Hopkins and how much overlap that would be since neither of them are really relying on speed in their game, which is what a lot of the other receivers in Kansas City do thrive at. On the other hand, I do think from like a body control standpoint and a hand control, there is going to be an element that DeAndre is going to be able to make Mahomes right and Mahomes make him right and vice versa. So the reason I do think, actually, you're right, maybe a little hyperbole. The reason yeah, I do yeah, think... No, no, I, is, I'm so here for you defending why this is massive breaking news that shakes the entire NFL. An undefeated Chiefs team that's won back-to-back -back Super Bowls just acquired somebody coming off a, a year where they had 75 catches for over 1,000 yards. It has been absolutely riddled in the mediocrity known as Will Levis every single week. The Titans are dumpster fire at this point. So... To me, you've got a Titans organization that is letting a player go. And the more people you talk around the Titans, they'll tell you that this was in part, hey, them tipping the cap saying DeAndre wants to go be somewhere else. Let's let DeAndre go somewhere else. But this is a guy coming off of a 1,000-yard season. So to me, 
You've got a, a team that we spend every single week trying to talk about like they're broken, even though they're undefeated. They just acquired a veteran wide receiver that's going to have meaning to their their outcome every single week. Like if you're the Bills and you thought you just made up ground by acquiring Amari Cooper, the Chiefs would say, okay, maybe DeAndre isn't Amari Cooper, but we were already ahead of you. So now we acquire somebody that we think gives us a plus, and frankly, that bridges that that extends more gap between where the Chiefs are and everybody else. So I think when you give a two-time defending Super Bowl champion and a quarterback that's absolutely epic, a receiver that can play as well as DeAndre Hopkins can, I roll my eyes to it. I'm like, my God, how are we in this situation again? The Chiefs yet again, like, we just got them closer to a three. As a collective NFL world, they just got closer to a three-peat in my mind. So that's, yeah, that story is why I think it's huge. You know what, you know what, Fitz, I love that. And I think you made a great case. And I think going back to two things can be true. Two things can be true that, you know what, I am not like, oh my gosh, whoever has the Andre Hopkins is going to be the the winner. But on the other hand, like, I think you did actually convince me that be, even if the receiver wasn't the caliber of some of the other receivers that have just been traded, because of who he's going to and because of the stakes on the line of can they three-peat as Super Bowl champions to be the first person, first team to win three years in a row, I think I think you make a pretty good point. And the other thing I'll say is that when you're talking about the people the Titans have let go, I mean, the same way that we talk about what Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield did after they went to the Carolina, Pan Carolina Panthers, there is something to be said for skilled players leaving the Tennessee Titans because A.J. Brown, when he left, I mean, look at what he had done for Philadelphia. Derrick Henry, he leaves. Look at what he's doing for Baltimore. So maybe I'm wrong and maybe Fitz, they, when the Chiefs hoist the Lombardi Trophy and DeAndre Hopkins catches one of the winning passes, you remind me of this and we will we will revisit. Very By the fair. way, it, it is hilarious that the Titans not that long ago were like, $20 million a year for a Ray J. Brown. That's ludicrous. We got to trade him right now. And they got Traylon Burks back. Well done, Titans. I wonder, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Cooper Cup and how Hopkins is a better fit for the price. I wonder if this knocks the Chiefs out of the Cooper Cup sweepstakes or anybody else who might get traded, Deont Deontay Johnson or whoever it is. Maybe the Chiefs are like, hey, we're all in. This is this is history we're chasing. The three in a row, Super Bowl wise, has never been done before. And and DeAndre Hopkins is just the first of a few moves we're going to do. Imagine if they did get Co Co Cooper Cup after this. And I don't think that's impossible still, because, again, you're chasing something that's never been done before. I don't think you sit there and say, uh, they want a late second round pick. Again, you're probably picking last in the second round anyway. So we can't afford that. You're just like, screw it. We want that third ring, so we're immortal. And I think Cooper Cup, if, if you're telling me that by the deadline, they got DeAndre Hopkins and Cooper Cup, I'd be like, wow, okay. Like, it's, it's all of a sudden, happening. why not? Well, why not? I, and I get the Chiefs. That's not really the Chiefs' mo to be How like. We're all in. How many older injured receivers are you going to bring in the building and think it's a good idea to give up all your draft capital? When, by the way, your draft capital is pretty valuable because, regardless of what round it is, Brett Beach is going to find you like True. Pacheco in the seventh. Yes, but I, I just wonder. You like, need some cost control players to come in through that draft. Yes, you do. But right now, the only thing that matters right now is three in a row. I think they're so focused on this. That I'm not. I'm not saying that I think the Chiefs will. I don't think they're going to make another big deal with any higher draft picks than what they just gave up. But I also don't think it's crazy because again, you're chasing something that's never been done before. You are the Super Bowl favorite right now. You're the only undefeated team left in the NFL. And I don't know if you leave anything to chance. If if you do trade a second round pick, you end up winning a Super Bowl. You're not going to sit there and say, oh goodness, we gave up that second round pick. You're going to be like, who cares? Here's three Lombardis for you. I agree with you about the stakes, but I think that had the Chiefs been operating on that principle, they would have kept Legarius Sneed and just mortgaged 2029 or something like that. Like they, They've already shown that they're not operating on those By the principles. way, the, you, somebody, I think it was Fitz mentioned the whole like Patriots, Chiefs, like the, the Patriots were so good at getting rid of players, like, and then they just never do anything again. Richard Seymour is one of the exceptions. He was actually pretty good with the Raiders, but most guys left the Patriots and just were ghosts after that. Look at what Legereus Sneed has done this season. Like, he was awesome last season, obviously. He went to the trade to the Titans, huge contract. He has done zilch with them. Absolutely nothing. It's crazy how all of a sudden the Chiefs have become the new Patriots in so many different ways. So, also, in the world of two things can be true. Not all draft picks are created equally depending on who owns them. Because I mm. think, Jory, you make a really good point that a fifth-round pick is meaningful to the Kansas City Chiefs. Why? Because they've proven they know how to draft. A fifth round pick means nothing to a bad football team. Like that, the, the number of times, and I've, I've said this for years as a Raiders fan, but Titans fans, I'll put you in the same boat. 
when your team stinks, a big part of why they stink is because they haven't drafted well. So miss me with any conversation about we got draft equity. Why am I suddenly going to think that you're going to then use that draft equity the right way? Draft equity matters to Kansas City, to Green Bay, to teams that have proven that they know how to draft over and over and over again to restock their rosters. Draft equity to me does not matter at all. So you might as well. That's why I always say they traded them for a bag of Skittles. The bag of Skittles is likely to have more meaning to the Raiders than anything they get back in draft capital. The bag of Skittles will have more meaning in the the draft room than anybody the Titans get because the Titans haven't drafted well. And now I'm looking straight at Rand Carthon, their GM, saying, okay, like uh, you can blame AJ on somebody else, different GM for that, Rand. You can't blame Derrick Henry on anybody but yourself. And like, I, I will steal this from my buddy Joe Fortenbar at ESPN Radio. I was listening to him the other day and he pointed out, we sit here and we just destroy the Cowboys for not signing Derrick Henry. We have yet to destroy the Titans for just letting him walk out the door. So now you got this young quarterback in Will Levis and you say, we're going to build around him. And all of a sudden you don't keep Derrick Henry. Your offense looks terrible. You trade DeAndre Hopkins for a fifth that could become a fourth that Frank smartly points out is likely to be the last or the second to last pick in its round. Like there's nothing happening here that gives me any faith that the Titans, they even know how to be competent when it comes to building a roster. You know what I think is interesting about the Derrick Henry conversation? So Cowboys team owner and general manager Jerry Jones went on his weekly radio show this week. Yes, he went back for those of us who discussed this <laughs> last week. And he talked about this Derrick Henry step. But what was more interesting to me than his comments was actually the context, which is that he was not asked about Derrick Henry. And despite not being asked about Derrick Henry, he talked about why they didn't sign Derrick Henry. Now, this is pretty par for the course for those of us who have been following Jerry for years is that – Say what you want about him. He is well aware of what the narratives are surrounding him out there. He is well aware of what the criticism is, and he understands what it is and likes to respond to it. And one of the things he said that he got some blowback for this week is that Derrick Henry wouldn't have done the same thing in the Cowboys scheme as he would in the Ravens scheme. And people are being like, what do you mean? You're not like schematically fit for Derrick Henry. But I do think there's something to be said of hey, these other teams that don't have Lamar Jackson, that is constantly going to be a factor in your running game if you always have to worry about Lamar taking off on any kind of like RPO play action type plays. If you don't have the offensive line, and I know that Baltimore's retooled some, but I think from a scheme, from an offensive line standpoint, from a quarterback, if you don't have that, not, you're not always like the same way that not every draft pick is the same from building to building. Not every player is the same from scheme to scheme and with different surrounding casts. And so I actually understood what Jerry was saying. Now, I'm not saying Derrick Henry wouldn't have made them better. I think there is a stronger case for a Derrick Henry type than a Devontae Adams type when your running game and your inability to stop the run it are, are like your number top one and two issues. But I do think that that's kind of the thing of like, would Derrick Henry be putting up these kind of numbers in Tennessee? I don't think so. Yeah, that's that's fair ish. He still screwed it up. Like he still screwed it. Like, come on. Like, I get it. Yes, Derrick Henry is. We talked about it in the offseason. Like the running lanes that were going to be available to him. He's probably like, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Not going back to Alabama. Not any at any point in the Ryan Tannehill era during the ten, with the Tennessee Titans. He's got to be like, you could actually play defense without nine guys in the box. This is crazy. I've never seen this before. So, yes, I do get that. But Jerry still screwed this up. We all know that, right? Like, you, you went out and were like, Zeke Elliott, everybody, he's coming back. Like, uh, yeah, you probably should have just signed Derek because he wanted to go there. Am I way too practical to think that, like, not everyone can sign everything and, like, not every player? Like, you just made the case, Frank, for, oh, of course the Chiefs should just figure it out. They're about to win their third straight Super Bowl. The Cowboys aren't in that place. So, like, should they be signing everyone? But they thought the at Cowboys... the time they thought they were. They're like, uh, this offseason, this offseason, they were like, we're a 12 win team. We're coming off a division title. And they should have been. I, I, they they should have signed up. Like, uh, Derek Hen it's very rare, I guess, that a good player is like, I want to go there. And that team is like, nah, that's fine. That's fair. I guess I do and understand pace for like, the fact of what like, is like 1,800 yards this year. Like he is, right. again, if, if running backs were still allowed to an MVP, like he, he'd he have a great, great case right now. And are you not signing Dak and CD back? But the, the, I think the cap is just different. I think the cap hits more for Henry now and, and Dak and CD later. I, I think they could have done it. Let's put it that way. If they really wanted to, I think they could have done it. I just think they, if I had to guess, in, uh, in all honesty, I thought they probably were like, Derrick Henry's going to be washed. He's going to be 30 years old. He's going to have all this workload. He's not worth the money anymore. And they just screwed that up. 
I want Frank to be in charge of our budget for Yahoo Sports, <laughs> for NFL travel, for all of these opportunities of like, but what if we are the most important news organization because we get this person, we hire this colleague, and we go to write this story, and we travel to this place in Germany? I would be like, I would be like, Jory's taking up so much of our salary cap, we can't do anything, guys. Sorry. I mean, like it's, <laughs> as somebody that lived through that at ESPN, I know that feels like, all right, all right, all right. I will say this. I, I'll tie this back to the, uh, I was dark. I'll tie this back to the Titans, and I know nobody cares about the Titans, but the one thing I would say to everything you just said, Jory, if... The belief is not every system can win and that Derrick Henry wouldn't have done this necessarily with the Cowboys. The, the, the Titans had him in the room. They never built whatever system has been built around him now. They never got the right players around this caliber of, of running back to do this caliber of running. Like the amount of mismanagement involved in this from the Titans, I think every point you just made, which is a strong point, is all the more reason I'm looking at the Titans and saying there's no one, there's no adult in the room. There's no one competent in the room that is helping them actually win football games. Because if you didn't, if it takes a certain style of quarterback, why did the Titans never acquire that style of quarterback? If it takes a style of play from your offensive line, why did they not, and why did they never build that system around Derrick Henry? Because we are seeing just how dominant it can be. And I know Lamar is special, but let's not get it twisted. This is not two-time MVP Lamar. They're asking something totally different from Lamar. And the fact that the Titans never explored this and then let him walk out the room, I just, I think that the Titans deserve, a, like, if the if the Cowboys deserve a little leg on their face, the Titans deserve a whole damn omelet. That's all I'm saying on it. Uh, uh, we've mentioned Cooper Cup I a few like times. I an omelet on the face would be not as bad as an egg on the face because the egg <laughs> is presumably raw and the omelet's cooked as someone who ate eggs this morning. Oh, yeah, I eat egg on your what, face. Yeah, well, what what, what would be the, what, what is the worse than egg on your face? Like, more egg, but not omelet, because once you cook it, the more cooked it is, the less bad the egg <laughs> on your face is. Okay, that's fair. Uh, as someone that cooks and eats egg whites every day, I which told means you I woke up on the cynical side you of the did. this wow. morning. I didn't expect that. this conversation. Uh, can't say, can't <laughs> lie. Can't lie. <laughs> if you haven't microwaved egg whites lately, you should. It just smells like sulfur in the whole place. So maybe it's just a whole bucket of egg whites dumped on somebody, and then they walk around the room, oh, smell like a fart yeah. all day. There we go. All right. Uh, Cooper Cup, uh, we mentioned it on this show. Uh, we were ahead of everybody else. It's nice that the world is caught up with Yahoo Sports. I will remind everybody that the Cooper Cup on the training block conversation has been out there from this very show for a minute. So all the more reason you should be hanging out with inside coverage all the time. That being said, what now? Uh, as it looks like, according to reports, the Rams have called multiple teams about trading Cooper Cup, indicating that they want a second round pick and they're willing to take on some of the 2024 salary. Jory, like, if you're the Rams here, are you getting takers at that value? Yeah, here's what I think we have to keep in mind. I'm not saying the Rams are not going to trade Cooper Cup. It's very possible that they do. But I think when you have a team put something out there with an asking price as high as the Rams are, this is the start of the conversation. This is not like we are not in the red zone. We are not at the five-yard line. We're not We're not pushing it to the end. I think the Rams are saying, look, like, let's just gauge interest of, okay, you see Devontae Adams go for what? A fourth that could become a third right. if he makes – it, what, that's what it was, right? Yeah, he has to make the all pro team and or start yeah, Devontae in the Adams start the for a fourth. Okay, for uh, fourth that yeah. could become a third if everyone and their mom works out, which this is the New York Jets we're talking about. Then you have Amari Cooper, who's going for basically a third and a change of late, th like day three picks. So now you have Cooper Cup, who I would not say currently offers more to a team than Amari Cooper and Devontae Adams does. And they're saying, but if we take his salary, maybe we'll get a second. I mean, they are more than welcome to ask. As C-Rob talked about on Inside Coverage last week, there is this idea of if you're not going to have him on the roster next year, see what you can get from him, especially if you can get a second round pick. I would be shocked if someone got a second round pick for him. I think that when I talk to people around the league and they look at what happened with Devontae and Amari last week, there is a sense of like maybe a third or fourth, more likely like a fourth and a day three pick. Like that seems like more what the Rams are likely to get for a player like this. And the other reason I don't think that we should be so sure that the Rams are going to trade him is, okay, let's say – and this would be an upset that the Rams beat the Vikings on Thursday night football. Mm -hmm. Not this weekend, like Thursday night here, yeah. football, which is happening soon, which also like I wouldn't put it past Sean McVay to figure out how to get his team ready for that and to like have kind of an upset and figure out how to thwart the Brian Flores coordinated defense that is really challenging the league. 
Well, then you're in an NFC West that feels wide open. Like, yeah, the Seahawks look better last week than they did before. The Niners are super injured, and maybe they'll get Christian McCaffrey back, but they're not getting Brandon Ayuk back. Like, this is still a team that I do think is in the playoff hunt, even if they haven't played so strongly and won so many games to start the season. And when you look at Cooper Cup, if you do feel like you're going to be competitive, well, Cooper Cup is playing at a position where the cost of the position has skyrocketed dramatically since you did that deal. And so if you do still believe in him, and again, I understand his injury history. I understand the case for trading him, especially when you have a guy like Puka Nakua with some degree of a similar skill set on a cheaper contract right now. But when you look at you need multiple guys at that position to do what you're going to do, $30 million doesn't look as bad when you're starting to see what these guys are making 29 million cap hit. Plus you've already paid a lot of it. And there's not a lot of guarantees when you start to have the 34, 35. I mean, this is not, I think the value of this contract looks different now after the Justin Jefferson and CD lamb deals. I I, I like the, that thought there because I keep thinking like if the Rams win Thursday, Puka Nakua is back at practice this week. Cooper Cup's supposed to be back on the field this week. All of a sudden, they're going to start talking themselves into, look at the 49ers. They're three and four. We're three and four. Why can't we just go and try to win this division? And I think that bumps up the price, too, because at that point, if you're the Rams, you're sitting there saying, yeah, we'll take a second, but you're going to offer us a fourth that could become a third? Nah, we'll just stick it out, see what happens this season, because we got our guys back and we can compete. I don't know that the Rams are at that level, but... They could talk themselves into it. Uh, so I think, yes, I think what happens on Thursday is actually going to affect all the the kind of talk about Cup and whether he's going to get traded and whether he's not. I still I still have a hard time believing of all the guys that they would trade Cup just because it's so, he's been such a big part of what they've done. And, and, and that's got to be a tough thing to, to, to let go of. But we'll see as it goes on. By the way, speaking of things that people are finally talking about that you first heard on Inside Coverage. I heard a lot of Jared Goff for MVP stuff this week. That was pretty cool. You could have heard mm-hmm. that three months ago on Inside Coverage. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll get done with my victory lap as, as Fitz uh, brings us a break or whatever. I, I love No, I love that victory lap, by the way. Uh, do we make <laughs> anything? Uh, and, and also, for fans that are unaware, this year they pushed the trade deadline to later. And I think the Rams are a great part of the reason why they push yes. the trade deadline to r- later. Let's just make that point. The trade deadline is two weeks from today, which is uh, a week later than it used to be. Uh, not a lot of people paid attention to that, but part of the reasoning was you need to give teams a little bit more time to figure out where they are. The Rams will have and, that and, opportunity. And it's one game, like we, me and George just talked about, you agree with, I'm sure. One yeah. game makes a big, big difference as far as the Rams. I believe that they're two and four right now. I, I hope I'm not wrong about that. But the difference between three and four, two and five is massive. Three and four, you're like, we're in this thing still. Two and five, you're like, eh, yeah, probably punting. So yeah, every week you push that trade deadline back changes the entire dynamic of the trade landscape. All right. One dynamic, obviously, that everybody's talking about is Russell Wilson being back as the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers. When we come back, Joey's got a feature on it. We'll break down a little bit of the why and some of the weird conversation happening around it. I'm just an idiot in front of a microphone. I'm lucky enough to talk to two people that uh, write really smart stuff for Yahoo Sports all the time. And Joey, you've been working on a feature on Russell Wilson for a long time. Like, this has been a, a labor for you. And it's a, it's coming out. It, it comes out tomorrow. Or, yes, tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, and a lot of it was about sort of Russ and his journey and his process. So start there because, you know, we talk about the Russ comeback. What went into it? Yeah, I think it's so interesting because even if you take it back more than a decade, you look at what Russell Wilson went through early in his career, and yes, he won a Super Bowl, but he also lost a Super Bowl in a really dramatic way. And some people, particularly at his stage in their career, would not have come back from that mentally and not have been able to rebound. And then you look at what he's gone through the last few years, and yes, he's a nine-time Pro Bowler and played at a really high level. And even last year, despite being benched toward the end of the season because of a contract dispute, essentially, he was still throwing 26 touchdowns to eight interceptions and still operating statistically at a very high level. And there's just a lot of negativity coming from different places, some in the building, some outside of the building. And so then he comes out Sunday night, and I think it was such fascinating circumstances under which he got his first start because he comes to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, yes, believes in him and yes, believes that he could start, but they're not paying him a lot of money. He's on veteran minimum because Denver is still responsible for so much of his salary. So this isn't like, oh, they just paid him $100 million over three years the way that the Atlanta Falcons did for Kirk Cousins. So they don't necessarily have the financial obligations to him in the same way. And yet, despite Justin Fields starting the season at four and two and 
being able to show a little more of a dual threat than maybe what we would expect from Russell Wilson. Mike Tomlin is very, very convinced that, hey, I'm going to give Russell his chance when he's healthy. He had the calf injury. He came back, and then he got re-aggravated, comes back again. So you go to Sunday night, and this guy who has not started a football game since I think it was Christmas Eve of last year is a little rusty at the beginning. There's some some passes that are thrown short. There are some balls that, oh, George Pickens didn't quite turn around when the ball was coming, all of that. And the Steelers fans on Sunday Night Football start booing him. It's my understanding there were even calls for Justin Fields from the crowd. I You can't really hear those on the broadcast, but the, you can definitely hear the boos on the broadcast. And Russ just comes back, throws for the most passing yards they've had all season, two passing touchdowns, another rushing touchdown. Again, that rushing element was a big uh, knock against him. And I thought it was such a fascinating exercise and just like mental discipline that you really, I mean, when you talk about blocking out the noise, he literally had to block out the noise of all of those fans booing him and just be like, okay, what does it take for me to get on the right page of this offense? And if you listen, the first question that he's asked after the game, Brandon Marshall was there for his podcast. And he said, I hate to ask you this, but like, what's going through your mind as you boo it? And, and Russell said, um, when I think back to my mental conditioning coach who passed a couple of years ago, he talked a lot about being neutral and staying the course. And that's what I had to do. And I was so excited that he said that because I've been working on this feature about neutrality, about tra- um, Trevor Moad, Russell's late mental conditioning coach and that philosophy and what does it mean? And I think one of the things that fascinates me is that Russell Wilson gets some, I would say even criticism for being too positive or too cliche or all of that, when really he's actually not trying to be positive based off the mental conditioning and psychology elements that he subscribes to. He's actually just trying to eliminate negativity and there's a difference. So Trevor Moad, his mental conditioning coach who died of cancer on September 15, 2021, had this idea that Positivity will work sometimes, maybe not all the time, but negativity works 100% of the time. And I actually talked to Trevor for a story in 2020, and uh, one thing he told me that has really stuck with me is that negativity is four to seven times more powerful than positivity, according to a lot of studies that are out there. So if you tell someone one negative thing and three positive things, they're much more likely to think about and fixate on the negativity thing. Now, biologically and evolutionarily, That makes sense because you needed to make sure that if there's a danger coming and there's a lion coming to eat you, that's more important than, hey, look, beautiful flower. But in today's world, it can be really, really challenging, particularly when we are kind of overwhelmed by all this negativity. And so sometimes Russell will say these things that I think people think um, borderline on like a little bit out of touch. And I was actually listening yesterday to Russell Wilson's interview with Brandon Marshall in the offseason where he's talking about the confidence he had in himself last year after they started one and five with the Broncos and Brandon Marshall's like that. Do you have to be a little bit delusional? And Russell said, yes, like greatness requires being a little bit delusional because when you think about the odds that all of these players are overcoming, it really is not realistic for them to think that any of these things are happening. So to tie this all together, what I think is fascinating is that it requires not only physical discipline, but also mental discipline to be able to come to to Pittsburgh, realize that even though you're in a later stage of your career, you're not going to let what happened in Denver define you. You're also not even going to like criticize Denver. Like He's not going out there being like, Sean Payton screwed me over. That's not what Russell's been saying. He's really tried to take the high road. You're not going to let the fact that Justin is starting these games get you down. And you're not going to let a few bad throws in the, in the first quarter or a few misfires in the first quarter get you going. So I understand it's a small sample size in terms of what Russell Wilson has done for the Pittsburgh Steelers so far. But I think that I have a lot of respect for the like several layers of mental discipline that are required for Russell Wilson to perform in the way that he just performed on Sunday night. I have a question for you, Jory, because you are a voter and you probably have not thought about this yet. The AP changed its kind of criteria or or reinforced the criteria for comeback player of the year, where basically they're saying like, you got to come back from something. Like it's got to be an injury. It's got to be something really bad. Would you consider Russell Wilson a comeback player of the year candidate? Would you vote for him? Because to me anyway, He did come back from something. He was treated so poorly last year by the Denver Broncos Mm. that, I mean, Sean Payton, they treated him so unprofessionally by basically saying, we are going to bench you for the rest of the season if you don't change your contract. I've never heard of anything that poor and that unprofessional. Like, that is horrible. And to basically be kicked to the curb by them and everything that happened in his two-year Denver stint, I thought he was done for him to come back. And obviously, he would have to perform the rest of the season but he looked good on Sunday. And if he performs anywhere near that level the rest of the way, 
to me, that's a comeback player of the year. I know he didn't have an ACL injury or anything like that, but to me, that's a comeback player of the year. I don't know what your thoughts on it are because you actually have a vote. Frank, that's so fascinating, and I, I hadn't thought of him that lens, so I'm so glad you made me think of that. First of all, <laughs> that conversation is funny because I stand by my Joe Flacco vote last year. The criteria were such <laughs> that you it, came Jory. back. I hated it, Don't get me going. Dua was your comeback player of the year, but whatever. I know. Everyone was like Damar Hamlin, and honestly, Damar Hamlin's football season last year looked like what it did this year where he has multiple interceptions. If he oh, had played yeah. football regularly last year, yeah. he would have gotten it, but he didn't play football at that level last year. It was even Tua, just on Tua a regular had a better basis. season. It was all concussions. We're, and now we're full circle with Tua. Anyway, go on, Joey. Go yes. On. So that said, when you look at the way that they rewrote the criteria based on all of the uproar that Joe Flacco coming off his couch beat Tamar Hamlin coming off his heart stopping, the actual language is that the award is now, quote, to honor a player who has demonstrated resilience in the face of adversity by overcoming illness, physical injury, or other circumstances that led him to miss playing time the previous season. Other circumstances did lead Russell to miss playing time the previous season. It did. Not a lot, in but term- yeah, it did. And depending how you're defining this, Injury led him to miss playing time this season. Correct so too. I think that I, I don't think it's crazy to factor him into the criteria. I think it's a little early in the season for me to feel like I know who I'm going to vote for, although yeah, that's fair. I, yeah, yeah. I will not I just vote like for Joe about Flacco. This year I can around, tell yeah. you don't I will vote not for vote. Joe. Don't I'm vote not for voting Joe. for Joe Flacco this year, even though going back to like our victory laps when I went to the Colts training camp this summer, I did believe that Joe Flacco looked better than Anthony Richardson. And I don't think that's crazy, even though the beat writers were like what are you talking about? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting situation. I don't think that what Sean Payton, I don't, I don't think surviving Sean Payton being words that I don't want to say out loud on this show, um, is what this award was intended for, but I do think it's a fascinating conversation. One real quick thing. I, I, we've talked, Russell Wilson's legacy is just fascinating. He's a guy who, is easy to kind of make jokes about because he he's a different dude, right? We've all talked about that a million times. And I think a lot of times it's just bullying from the media, honestly, about how he is treated, how he is talked about because he is a, just different. And he, he, he puts himself in those positions. I get that a lot. But if you look at his career, making nine Pro Bowls in 10 years with the Seattle Seahawks, he was on a Hall of Fame track. He goes to Denver, basically plays himself out of that. I wonder if he had, look, look again, he's got to replicate this entire season. It's just one game against a Jets team that is in chaos, right? But if he replicates this the rest of the season, if the Steelers make the playoffs, if Russ plays well, I wonder if he gets himself back on the Hall of Fame track. Like, because everybody at that point might say, yeah, that Denver experience was so miserable for him that if you look at the rest of it, Seattle, Pittsburgh, it's been pretty good for Russell Wilson. I just think he's a fascinating figure to this entire season. All of a sudden, I thought he's done, he's washed. We saw preseason, he stunk, he was hurt. Mike Tomlin's a, a, crazy to put him back in the lineup, but you watched him play Sunday night, and it was like, wow, that that that's the dude I remember from Seattle. If he can keep this up, he's going to be a fascinating, fascinating dude the rest of the year. I, I will say uh, I thought Russ was washed coming into this season. Uh, he definitely played really well in that game. And let's see what it looks like moving forward. That being said, I do think that there's been a wildly unfair conversation around Russell Wilson for a minute. And frankly, we treat him like he's just the worst, too. Like not we on this show, but the overall collective tone about how fake he is and how inauthentic he is. And I guess one Former of the Walter, things that, a Walter Payton man of the year. Yeah, right. But uh-huh. yeah, but I also look at all of this. I'm like, what if y'all like that's who he actually is? Mm-hmm. Uh, has anyone stopped different. for he's, a second and just thought yeah. about the fact that maybe Russ is just a different dude and maybe he really is like always trying to find a positive out of these things like there there are certain traits to this that we've sort of labeled as you know well, I don't like him like it, okay in a league full of people that have done terrible things that still get to play football we talk about Russ like he's in that same category sometimes because people simply mm-hmm. don't like him and they don't like him because he's too nice because he's mm-hmm. too saccharine, because he's too positive. Because he works like, too hard, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, it, I, I just don't I get it. He's, he's weird at times, right? Like, I get it. But yes, you are a hundred percent. I've thought this for many years where it's like, it's gone too, it's just too easy for some of these guys to just totally just shred this, Russell Wilson. Like, Russell I, Wilson's not a guy who's been in prison. Like, he's not a guy who's had domestic violence issues. Like, save your, save your angst for those guys, uh, not Russell Wilson necessarily. And I also think it'd be one thing if like sometimes people got frustrated 
started with something or yes, clearly we've seen how winning and losing changed the perspective on any of these guys. But like there's just so much negativity in the in the public discourse about Russell Wilson in the last few years that it it came off quite frankly to me as lazy of like everyone just wanted to pile on everyone right. to be like oh look at this guy doing his lunges on the plane well like okay Russell <laughs> Wilson has this crazy, philosophy of like if I can spend a million dollars on my on my body a year and then look at what I can do for my team like if he's trying to counteract whatever's happening on the plane when we I would agree with him that a lot of the international demands on these players bodies are not in the best interest of them playing football at the highest level particularly he's 35 years old right now like I don't I don't know. I think it's frustrating and I think that people think that maybe some of it's not relatable, which is fine, but I think there's a difference between being like this isn't for me and this is not what this guy should be able to do. I mean, again, I'm not trying to be like oh yeah, like let's just go through everyone's charity things, but like the hospital visits which he has done in every single city regardless of all that. Like I think he's really uplifting so many people in all of these cities. Um and in terms of the positivity, what's fascinating about it is that I don't even know that he's trying to be more positive. I think he's just less negative than everybody else. And the reason for that is because, again, his, his mental conditioning coach felt so strongly about the, the power of negativity that even saying some of these things aloud, there are studies about what that can have on our brain. And so the idea isn't that you say, like, I know that we're going to throw all these touchdowns. It's more, I know I'm going to pay attention to where my receiver is on this route. I know that I'm going to focus on what my protection is doing. It's really about the process to get to that success rather than just like always assuming everything is going wrong. Like it's acknowledging what's happening, acknowledging the reality, and then saying, okay, now that I acknowledge the reality, what am I going to do about it? Like it's not just focusing on, oh no, like I didn't throw that interception. It's not delusional in the sense of denying the facts of reality. It's just not dwelling on the negative and maybe people just find the negative more relatable, but like that probably says more about us than it does about Russell Wilson. I, I will tell you honestly, Jory, that there have been a few times in my life, and, and look, I, I'm, everything you're describing, like I just don't, I don't carry a lot of negativity in my life. I never have. And when I left the band, the number of outlet, media outlets that reached out to me that wanted to get some sort of a, just a saucy story about you know leaving a band and like what it must mean, and I just. I didn't feel any of that. When I when I got let go by ESPN, I did not intend to go viral, but I put up a video on social media because everybody was speaking for me. It's like, oh, the world's got to be, everybody must be pissed off. I put a video up. There was like, man, I'm incredibly thankful. ESPN changed my life. Like they gave me an opportunity. And that video ended up getting millions of views, which I didn't expect. But I had some people that were let go at the same time that still have anger towards me because I didn't have the same level of animosity. They had like, I think we have to accept some, and, I, and I, this is me. Like some people just, I wake up every day and I, I rarely say, man, I have to do this. I always say I get to do this. It's not because I sit here and I'm, I'm like trying to be poly positive. It's just how I'm wired. Like I'm just, I'm wired to be a positive person. So I guess I look at it so much of what Russ does and uh, yeah, is it, is it a little bit, you know, is it a little bit sweet for me sometimes? Is it a little bit too like, you know, cheery sometimes in the messaging? Yeah, that's not for me, but am I going to hate him on it? And I, I say this carefully because I don't want anyone to jump down my throat, but if you're honest about the way we have covered certain quarterbacks in the NFL, I was a fan of Derek Carr and I watched all of it happen with the Raiders and the number of people, even internally, some people in that room that would tell you off the record, man, I don't know. I just don't buy it. That's not who he really is. We do the same thing with Russ. We did the same thing for a long time with Kirk as a general rule. We as a football society seem to have a problem with super Christian dudes that come out and play quarterback that are always positive. And I like as a person That's that fair. doesn't have That's any fair. faith, I'm not coming at this like mm -hmm. I want to be very clear here. I'm not coming out here planting a flag of faith. I am just looking at it saying, man, we cover guys that live positively with their faith on their sleeves at the quarterback position in the NFL differently than we cover ways the, the guys that don't. Kind of goes back to Kurt Warner, too. I mean, there was a lot of cynicism about Kurt Warner, wasn't there? And I, again, yeah, I don't come from this as a place of faith either, but I get what you're saying. And I, I don't necessarily disagree. Like, yes, if you are in this ultra, ultra negative world and goodness knows it's only going to get ramped up over the next couple of weeks, if you are super cheery and super positive, you get dunked on all the time for some reason. And it can't be sincere and all this and all that. So uh, that, that's a probably a, a, a much bigger, larger conversation about society as whole. But I agree with a lot of what you said. Right. And I think that to me, trying to be in a society where we have different perspectives and we have different um, 
sources of motivation and inspiration and all of that and don't need everyone to be the same type of religious, same type of same religion or same ways that they practice their religion. Like that doesn't mean to me that we should then say anyone who does believe in this, particularly when they're generally using it for good rather than harm, like we should go after them for it. I think, yeah, religion, like almost all influences in society, when taken to extreme can lead to negativity. So can almost everything that really influences us. But I don't think these guys are using it that way. And so I think that we should be honest with ourselves about why we feel this criticism and why we feel this inauthentically. And uh, look, uh, one thing a buddy of mine, as I started my fitness journey a few months ago, said, he said, you'll find this. The more you go down this road, your friends would never have looked at you and said, man, you're eating too much right now. Your friends will never look at you and say, man, you're drinking too much right now. But once you start really committing to not eating, not drinking and going to the gym, your friends will say, man, you're getting really compulsive about this workout thing. You're getting really compulsive about what you're eating. And I have experienced that over and over and over again. We as a society, like it's almost like we're more comfortable with everybody that wants to tear things down because we yeah. like to live in that. And when you've got anybody that sort of found this rhythm, found this, whatever their light, whatever your light is, if you found it and you're living it and you're wearing it on your sleeve, then immediately it's a society that's like, whoa, 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 don't take it too far. Like moderation. Nobody ever talked to me about moderation when I was drinking a bottle a day years ago in my life. That's all I'm saying. But now, like now that I'm working out, it's like, well, moderation, man, you can skip the gym today. That it's a small microcosm in the way we cover absolutely everything. All right, we've gotten too deep. We'll get back to football. Frank did power <laughs> rankings. If there's anything I know, they'll suck. So we'll break down the power <laughs> rankings. We'll do it next. <laughs> All right, Frank, uh, the Lions go all the way up to number two in this week's power rankings. Good sir, you've, you've just throttled them over the Ravens. What do you do? Yeah, I, it was tough. I ain't gonna lie, because I really respect this Ravens team. You know what's in the back of my mind, Fitz? Uh, this team lost to the Raiders. Like, I can't let it go. Like, oh, the, how did this happen? How did It is on their resume. That's why I have the Ravens three, but I view... I view the the Lions and Ravens as almost like uh, twin cities of each other in the AFC and the NFC, where th they're both just fantastic offensively with so many different options on offense that they, they could put up 40 on anybody. I would love to see a Ravens-Lions Super Bowl. I can't lie, because the over-under on that would be like 79 and a half. It would look like a Big 12 game. So I, I just put the Lions ahead of the Ravens because I was so impressed with what they did at Minnesota, facing adversity time after time after time and just keep punching back, punching back. They eventually get the win over what I think is a very, very good Vikings team. That's why I put them number two. I believe right now the Lions are the second best team in football. Yeah, I mean, what's fascinating to me is that I think the three NFC teams that would least want to play in the playoffs right now are all coming from the NFC North. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting talking to people around the league how they rank those three teams. I mean, people are really, like, down on Minnesota. And by down, I don't mean, like, oh, they're the 25th team in the league. But a lot of people are like, oh, because they don't believe in Sam Darnold the same way that they believe in what Jordan Love and Jared Goff can do from the quarterback position. They don't ultimately believe that Minnesota is going to be able to have the same chance in the playoffs, which I think that maybe Sam Darnold doesn't have the track record that the other two guys have. But look at the talent he has around him and look at the defense he's playing alongside. I definitely am super impressed with the Lions. And let's also not forget that they did this after losing Aiden Hutchinson. Like, this is not like, a, like oh, they had full power and, oh, they had all of their weapons. Like, they lost one of their top three best players, one of their top three most important players, maybe their best player and top three most important player. Again, it depends how you're weighing different positions against each other. But to be able to do what they did in spite of losing him and with the emotions of losing him is so impressive. And a part of this, too, and this is unfair to the Ravens. I get that. But if I'm looking at the, the scope of the season and saying, OK, well, the Ravens are going to have to somehow beat the Chiefs. I don't know that they could do that. When I look at the NFC, I'm like, who who would I pick over the Lions right now to win the NFC? The answer is nobody. And that includes the 49ers. That includes whoever, Commanders, Eagles, whatever. I view all of them on a much different tier than the Lions right now. Whereas the Ravens, I'm like, are you going to make a Super Bowl this year? Because you're going to have to knock off the Chiefs. And I don't, or even, I mean, the Bills are a really good team. The, the AFC is just so much better, I think, than the NFC right now at the top. That part of this is... I think the Lions are going to make a Super Bowl because there's nobody in the NFC. I really would pick over them right now. I think the NFC is going to be more exciting because there are a bunch of teams bunched together. But you're right. Let me let me ask this, like, because we just started at number two. 
Is all of this just meaningless and worthless and we should just fast like forward it. to February and give the Chiefs the Super Bowl? Like, it so I, seems like it. This defense I is I mean, so now good. that they have DeAndre Hopkins. <laughs> That's called a callback. We're circling back all the way I mean, back. I just that. look at it. One thing that we're going to have to talk about at some point, and we ha- kind of talked about it, we, this narrative, the Chiefs did what nobody else has ever done really in professional sport, at least in the NFL. They've reinvented themselves. I can tell who's lazy and who's not in the NFL circle. By if they're like Patrick Mahomes is just doing it again, they're undefeated. This is not a this is a defensive team. This is the 2000 Ravens or the 2002 Buccaneers or the 85 Bears or whatever team with a great defense you want to put out there. They just happen to also have an all world quarterback who can make plays when he has to. They've reinvented themselves. It's crazy to me what they've done. And yes, it, when you look at it from that scope of they have this elite, elite defense, I, I just think it's somehow better than last year. And they also have Patrick Mahomes. How do you beat this team? How do you win? I I get anything can happen, especially in a playoff game. But man, it it gets tougher and tougher as weeks go by to to figure out a way where somebody beats the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, you mentioned that. And I will say here, like if you look at the uh, good old fashioned quarterback rating uh, stat line for, I know that's a weird stat, but if you look at the rating, uh, it was a 44.4 for Mahomes in the win over San Francisco in a dominating win. His lowest win. passer rating of his career. Really? I mean, wow. 44.4. I mean, that and is just... one by 10 on the road against the 49ers, I, who I don't think are he, a bad team. And, and considering that, you know, week one, it was a 101.9. He has not gotten above a 90 the rest of the season on his quarterback <sighs> rating. So, like, wow. th- this is he's just not the MVP, not... guys. He's not the MVP. He's not the MVP. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I know he's, he's the betting favorite. He is not. The he's year, a comeback he? player of the year, maybe. Jory, I'm he, getting in your head. Jared Goff, Jared Goff. He is, like, look, at, at this point, the Chiefs are not winning. Just like I said, the Ravens aren't winning games because of their two-time MVP. The Chiefs aren't winning games because they have the best quarterback of this generation, maybe the best quarterback of all time. They're winning games because their defense is just flat out better than anybody. And I yep. man, I don't know how you beat that. Like, as, as Frank and I have said a hundred times on these, these shows, the only way you're going to beat the Chiefs, they're going to make it ugly, it's going to be a close game, which means you're going to have to beat Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes in a close game. And we all know what <laughs> the stats are. They're not going to make Andy that Reed crazy Patrick mistake. Patrick. You need to win games it's, like it's that. It just they're doesn't not, happen. Yeah, no, you're not going to be like, oh, yeah, well, of course, Patrick Mahomes threw a 95-yard pick six in the fourth quarter. No, that ain't going to happen. Like, I don't know how you beat them. Can I ask you if it's so clearly from a passing game standpoint only, I don't think that the Chiefs are winning because Patrick Mahomes is throwing more touchdowns than interceptions and all that. But I think when you look at some of the key plays that Patrick Mahomes made in a game when both quarterbacks were really struggling against the defense, like he did have that rushing touchdown, which by the way, it was hilarious that when he like unintentionally kind of trucked a guy rushing in for the touchdown, he was like, oh, it's my dad, Bob. Look at this weight I'm carrying. I didn't even mean to, mean to throw it in. And then he also had that 33-yard scramble that was really key down the left sideline. And I think that Patrick Mahomes made play, or like a shovel pass that all of a sudden goes for eight yards instead of two. And I love Tom Brady on the broadcast being like, he is breaking every rule I ever learned quarterbacking. And Bill Belichick is at home ripping out his hair right now. I think all this is to say that I agree that Patrick Mahomes needs to play better in the playoffs if they want to win a Super Bowl. But I also think that he is doing certain things in spite of the cast around him that are actually winning the games for yeah, them. Now, they're not fair. keeping that's them fair. competitive to get over the top, but I do think he's still winning games for them. Agreed. Agreed there. I, I think that's fair. Like, I don't want this to get turned into Patrick Mahomes isn't good enough. I think Patrick Mahomes is being asked to be Superman every single every single drive of every single game. And that's asking a lot of anybody. Uh, he's, he's managing that better than most. It's just... I, if they didn't have an all-world defense, I think they've got three losses this year. You know, and that's just uh, it, also if that all-world defense didn't have Patrick Mahomes, they probably have three losses. So I, I acquiesce to both sides uh, on that. You you put uh, Russ and the Steelers from twelve to ten in your power rankings, and this was sort of my my weird thought. Like we were talking about awards at the end of the season. Right now, is it pretty clear that Tomlin and Quinn are the front runners for Coach mm. of the Year? Could like, be. I mean, uh, I don't I don't disagree. I'd I'd also because I, I hate the way coach of the year is voted on. I'd say Andy Reid 
because why not? He's the best coach in football, and oh, coach of the year never goes to the best before. coach. Yeah, like, yes, it's so dumb. The, the coach of the year never goes to the best. Like no, I think it goes Spalestra. to whatever team we thought was going to suck, and then the it's, team it's doesn't so suck. Yeah, so then because, it must be the coach because it's our own ego where we say, "Well, we couldn't have been wrong on our preseason prognostications. It must have <laughs> been that this guy was Lombardi all season." Like it is. It, that is what it is. I think I heard that the other day that Eric Spalestra, the best coach in the NBA with the Miami Heat, has never won coach of the year. Like it's it's so dumb. So I it, honestly I would throw Andy Reid out there just because again he's the best coach of football. He's got an undefeated team. Maybe that should be coach of the year one of these years. I don't know. But on the Steelers, look every week it just about in power rankings. When I you know I work I I do take this very very seriously. I think I do it differently than everybody else. I look at the number next to a team's name and I say, are they really? Is that? Re-? And I did that with the Steelers. I'm like are they really the 10th best team of football? And I looked at 11 and 12 and 13. And I said, none of these teams are better. Uh, and there's an argument to be made that maybe Steelers should be higher. They're five and two. Their offense has kind of come alive. It looked great against a talented Jets defense last week. Where should the Steelers be? Do we think this is sustainable? Are they going to be a 12 win team this year that goes to the playoffs? I don't think they're better than Ravens, but they can still make the playoffs as a wild card. I don't know where I'm at with the Steelers because I don't know if this... We spend so much time in the offseason talking about, this is it for Tomlin. He's finally going to have a losing season. This is, The Steelers are going to stink. And they definitely don't stink, and they look like a playoff team to me. I just don't know. Is this the 10th best team of football? Are they better? I, I, I don't know what to do with the Steelers right now. Yeah, the Steelers are really interesting because, again, I get... I always say that my rooting interests in football aren't for a team. They're sometimes for a single player, and they're often for the story I'm working on being relevant. And so I definitely want this Russell Wilson story to be relevant. That said, as I'm reporting this story, I'm like, we know this defense has been great and been able to win with multiple quarterbacks. We know George Pickens can do stuff, and look how much more he and several guys, including Pat Firemuth, even Darnell Washington, were able to do with Russell Wilson at quarterback. And I would say what concerns me most is their offensive line, but I didn't think that that looked like a huge problem against the Jets defense that, yes, Hassan Reddick wasn't in there and apparently is coming back and clearly going to be the savior of everyone and their mom. But I do think that, like, Russell was able to mitigate some of those problems. And so I think that if he, if his quarterback play can resemble what it did in his first start, that should be a frisky team in the playoffs. It should be a, a, a team that's able to continue to beat people. And also there's something many, to say with the momentum. Wins? How many wins, Jory? How many wins do you think they get? Oh, can I, can I look at the schedule? Uh, the schedule's like, tough. Yeah. That's the thing. They have not played, right. I believe, any AFC North games. Maybe one. I don't yeah, think so, though. Have, but now Cleveland have... looks a lot easier. The Bengals, what are the Bengals right now? I think right they'll now? beat the Giants. I think they'll, I mean, look, the Commanders, yes, Jaden Daniels is great, but their defense isn't any good. And I think that the Steelers' defense is enough to do that. Okay, I think they'll lose to the Ravens, beat the Browns, beat the Bengals, beat the Browns. I think they'll that's be five the wins. Eagles you just again. put that's ten. I mean, yeah, <laughs> off the top. So I'll, yeah. I'll give them one against the Ravens because AFC North is weird. Mm-hmm. So even if they lose to the Chiefs, I mean, I think they could win eight of their next ten games. That's crazy. That, like that. That'd yeah. be insane. Like they, that'd be a thirty to four football team if they pulled that off. Right. So and, so let's so let's account for crazy. some variability. I think they'll have eleven or twelve wins and make yeah. the playoffs, which is an unbelievable year for them. I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, 11, 11 or 12 wins. Also, I still think that they're going to be Cooper Cup contenders. Like, I mm, think that they're the team mm. that makes the most sense for Cooper Cup. I mean, I think the three teams that I would most want to get Cooper Cup if I'm GM, which I'm definitely not, are the Buccaneers, the Commanders, and the Steelers. And when you look at which of the three are probably closest to a playoff run, it's not the Commanders. So it's one of the other two. I, if I'm the Bucks, I do try and get him. But I think that if you're the Steelers, you're an ASC team, so you have that working for you in terms of the Rams not having to get comfortable with giving him someone in the conference. You have a defense that's been playoff caliber for a while. You now have a quarterback who you seem to believe, again, small sample size, but so far can maximize the talent more. And oh, by the way, one of the biggest reasons you wouldn't want to pay someone like that is because you have to pay your quarterback. Well, you're not really paying your quarterbacks this year. And it's just a couple years. So in a couple years, you can reset. Like, you're not trying to get Cooper Cup for 10 years. So I think that they make the most sense. And we know that they want a receiver. They were one of the most vocal, or by vocal, I mean other people speaking on their behalf, um, teams in the Brandon Ayuk conversation. So also, if you're Brandon Ayuk and you wanted to go to a team that you wanted to win, like, I think that if Cooper Cup wants to go to a team that is capable of winning, I think the Steelers are capable of winning. Yeah, and you mentioned what you think the biggest question mark is. I think George Pickens is the biggest question mark currently for the Steelers. Like, if you're talking about a, a receiver that 
at times has been less than reliable and at times has been checked out. I do think getting somebody in the room that just can sort of push him and also push the right buttons would be a huge get for the Steelers. It helps very, uh, vary up their offense a lot too. So uh, what, the Dolphins, real quick, will do this one. Uh, you had him at 24. Does the, the return of Tua, will that drastically change anything for you? It's a, impossible to rank teams like that because I'm like, do I rank them where they are now and what they've done or do I rank them having Tua back? I think when Tua comes back, I, I think they become a top 12-ish team again. Like, I really do. Like Feels right. It, we see the splits between when Tua's in, Tua's out, and with Tua, they're a very good football team. The, the stat that blew my mind this Frank week. Frank is look- Tua's PR person, <laughs> and I honestly respect it. I, I am. I, I, I think Tua is the most disrespected player in the league, maybe, I, because everybody just wants to be like, oh, he's not that good, he's not that good. Well, stats are stats. Production's production. I, Tua does it week in, week out, and when he's replaced, his replacement level guys are the absolute bottom of the barrel. Like, the, the Dolphins are unwatchable without him. A stat that I, I blew my mind this week. They've scored 70 points this whole season. They scored 70 points in a game last year. Okay? Yeah. Like, this is, it's crazy what's happened to the Dolphins without Tua. I didn't know what to do with them, so I just kind of punted, left them at 24. And Tua will probably come back this week. He'll probably throw for like 340 yards because that's what he usually does. They're going to beat the Cardinals, and I'll have them up at like 13 next week. I respect it. We'll break that down next week. Uh, that, that's the way that works. Uh, Thursday Night Football preview, uh, Minnesota at the Rams. Uh, Minnesota is the three-point favorite. We've been picking this game every week. Uh, amazingly, Frank has picked it correctly six times. Jory's at four, me at three. Stone still waiting to get on the board, producer extraordinaire. Uh, but Stone has been, to his credit, has simply been picking against us the last few weeks because we've all agreed. <laughs> Will we all agree on this one? The Vikings at the Rams. Vikings got to win by at least three. Frank, what do you think? I, I think we're going to agree. And, and darn it, the Buccaneers blowing that game. I would have been 7-0. and oh. They didn't blow that game against the Falcons, which they should have won. That's a story for another day. I... I don't know why this spread is only minus three. The Vikings are clearly better. And yes, you might there might be some letdown after that loss against the Lions. The Rams getting cut back obviously helps if he does play. I just this Rams defense is not good. I, I don't I, I just view the Vikings being way, way better than the Rams at this point. Minus three was surprising to me. I thought it would be at least above the field goal, which is obviously a key number to our friends in Las Vegas. I Vikings all day. Like this this was a pretty easy pick for me. I've got it. I've got the Vikings too, Jory. What do you got? I'll go Vikings, even though I think that Sean McVay, particularly against a coach formerly on his staff, like will always have a few tricks up his sleeve. And I think that's why it's minus three and not minus seven or eight. But when you look at what the Vikings are coming off of with the Lions, I think they're going to be pretty motivated to get that taste out of their mouth as soon as possible. Which, by the way, taste is strong because they still looked good. It was just they were playing another really good team. But I do think that the Vikings are probably so aware of how competitive their division is and how much they need every single win outside of the division because the division wins are, or the division games are not going to be guarantees. So uh, at halftime, are they going to pull off quarterback trade and all of a sudden Sam Donald becomes the new quarterback of the Rams? <laughs> be I just awesome. Just That'd curious. Awesome. Based on I'd, I'd pay to see that. Like, just switch teams at halftime. Do we like, think uh, that report was credible? No. No. That's why we just, we glossed over it. I like, have thoughts on this offline. Uh, <laughs> Stone, by the way, has chimed in only saying whose house. So apparently uh, being at the yeah, Rams house sure, means yeah. something. Uh, tremendous she has home. a chance. Yeah. I, I just chance, don't yeah. count I, I, Sean McVay I hate, I hate, I hate. Matthew Stafford, like, if there's a quarterback right. who's got, like, the veteran savvy to be able to handle the blitzes and all of that, like, I don't know. I don't like going I don't know. They could barely handle the Raiders defense last dog. week. Yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, uh, yeah. it, it, I just don't like what I've seen out of this Rams team, but maybe Cup, look, Cup gets another 21 targets like he did a few weeks ago. Uh, it's possible. I think Vikings by double digits, and it's a uh, Vi- Vikings cruise on this. This is a beer game in Minnesota. They'll be sitting up with their feet, drinking a beer at halftime, not even paying attention. They'll be doom scrolling midway because they won't be paying attention. Uh, you should always pay attention to Stone. We thank him. Uh, he does great works behind the scene. Uh, he's the real glue that keeps this thing together. Follow us on Twitter. You know how to do that. And then uh, we'll be back on Friday hanging out. As always, rate, subscribe, review, tell your friends, your family, tell your enemies, tell everybody to hang out with us every single episode. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.